So, um, you know, what I wanted to talk about is um, there's a lot of focus on, you know, the technical problems associated with uh, getting Wi-Fi to work uh, from a transport and a roaming perspective. Uh, and obviously those are, you know, difficult problems and we're spending a lot of time uh, in, in getting that right. But at Cisco, we've spent a lot of um, uh, energy over the last, uh, I would say, year or so in trying to figure out what comes next. You know, now that uh, you have all this infrastructure that's been uh, installed out there, uh, are there creative ways in which we can um, provide user services that they find useful? You know, Gavin touched on a couple of them, uh, and, and thereby, uh, you know, make it useful for them, and of course, you know, in the process, allow uh, service providers and operators to, um, you know, to get additional ARPU. So just to step back a little bit, you know, all of you are familiar with this. You know, 11, 12 years ago, you know, Wi-Fi started out just as a hotspot service. You walked into a coffee store, you got Wi-Fi, you know, maybe you paid some uh, small amount of money for the service. Um, and, and clearly, you know, the, uh, we've come a long way since that, especially with, um, you know, with the deployment of uh, Wi-Fi as a mobile offload uh, technology. Uh, and, you know, the speed with which that's happened has been staggering. We'll get into some details on that, uh, especially from the perspective of, you know, what still remains, uh, what's going to happen next. But as I said, our key focus is understanding how can we take the infrastructure that's been put in place by service providers uh, or, you know, in many cases by non-traditional service providers, uh, for example, you know, venue operators, uh, hospitality chains and so forth, and provide the ability to... Uh, create innovative new services and applications. And the way we are approaching it is, you know, we think there needs to be some Darwinian experimentation in this area. So we are helping provide a lot of the network infrastructure for this and then working with our partners, uh, you know, service providers and others uh, to go run some of those experiments. So from, a, um, you know, from an offload perspective, uh, most of this stuff is all obvious to you, so I won't get into um, the details, except maybe to just you know, touch on a moment uh, around the comment about Wi-Fi being ubiquitous. Um, I think Edgar mentioned yesterday that there's you know, two billion Wi-Fi chipsets that shipped last year. And you know, I'm guessing that more than half of them go into devices which don't have a SIM card. This is very important, and it, it'll continue. A Wi-Fi chipset today probably costs less than $1 to the buyer. And so, you know, once it's at that price point, you can embed it in everything. You can embed it in a light bulb. You can embed it in, in um, you know, thermostats. Uh, you can, you, can uh, you know, get all these devices that have Wi-Fi embedded in them. And so that has enormous implications, not just in terms of uh, the traffic, but also scale, you know, number of connections that need to be supported, um, you know, making sure that the authentication modes that are used are, you know, don't require an individual to go in and enter um, a password and so forth. Uh, but the really interesting question is, uh, again, uh, you know, the transport problems will get solved, you know, offloads um, well underway. What comes next? And so from our perspective, you know, what's shown in the right-hand column is what comes next. I'm not sure if today is the right term. Maybe it should be tomorrow. But the, um, you know, at one level, it's about providing uh, universal access. And, you know, I think we are already getting there. Um, uh, Andy talked about... Uh, you know, more than half a million hotspots in, in, in London and you know, 30 meter inter access point spacing. So clearly, you know, at least here, you know, there's, there's that type of uh, pervasive coverage already. But I think the interesting question is uh, you know, what you see in the, in the last two rows, which is how do you make the applications and the content? How do you make the, uh, you know, the experience that the users uh, go through contextual? You don't want to take you know, some standard experience that they go through and serve it up. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the examples that uh, Gavin walked through for how they're trying to make the connection with the user and make, make it useful, I think that's key. So it's got to be contextual. You know, the service, the application that is being provided needs to be relevant based on the, you know, the physical location you are in, based upon, you know, the activity that you are currently uh, engaged in. Uh, and then the other thing that's key is it's got to be personalized. You know, um, none of us like to have stuff you know, shoved down at us. And if you take some you know, generic uh, stuff that's been canned content or canned applications and force it down on users, uh, that's, that's not very interesting. So I think a lot of work needs to be done here to figure out how you can, uh, taking uh, advantage of knowledge of a user's location, of a user's profile, their habits, uh, 
create applications and services that are uh, useful and interesting uh, for them. And um, you know, clearly that's something that as an industry we need to uh, make a lot more progress on. So in terms of first principles, you know, this is how you know, we see the landscape, which is Wi-Fi helps uh, save money and Wi-Fi should help make money. And I think uh, you know, the stuff on the left-hand side is well understood. I think the stuff on the right-hand side is where um, we as an industry are, um, are taking some, uh, uh, some first steps. So stuff on the left-hand side is kind of obvious. Uh, you know, it's, it's clear that Wi-Fi helps with churn reduction. It's clear that it helps with uh, acquiring new customers. Andy talked about how uh, you know, the ubiquity of Wi-Fi is one of the top three reasons why new users uh, sign on to uh, BT. So uh, that's clearly established. And uh, equally, you know, with offload, I think it's well documented that uh, you know, there's kind of been this tremendous uh, uh, Wi-Fi came along at the right time as a crutch uh, to help um, you know, with congestion on the uh, mobile data networks. And since then, it's gone uh, uh, in a different direction, which I'll touch on later. But that's, those two uh, models are very clear. What's less clear is, how do you make money? And as I said, you know, this is something that we've been uh, working on uh, with partners. Uh, there's two things that I'll focus on in today's presentation, and there's about you know, half a dozen other things that we are uh, experimenting with. One is the idea, and, and both of the things I'll talk about you know, center around the idea of if you know exactly where the user is, if you know what they're doing, and if, you have that, if you're able to react to that information in real time, uh, then we think that uh, you, know, you have the basics of um, uh, what, what's required in order to create useful services. So one of them centers around location analytics. So, you know, kind of the canonical ex uh, example of the shopping mall. If you knew exactly, um, uh, you know, what the foot traffic is through the mall, do people linger at certain stores? If there's signage that's put up in certain locations, does that change the user behavior? Um, so, you know, this has, uh, you know, significant business implications, for example, for the mall owner in terms of understanding uh, you know, how to price uh, the rental for their stores, um, you know, how to uh, charge for digital signage. In, in some cases, uh, you know, being able to, uh, you know, kind of go back and tweak uh, the way the mall is laid out uh, to make it more efficient. Uh, but the other thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'll give you a, a, you know, a specific example, is around location-based advertising. So the idea is obvious here. The examples I'll walk you through are ones where we have... Um, uh, put this in, in practice uh, with our partners and you know, monitor the user behavior and uh, you know, we have some uh, uh, you know, we have some good insights and uh, promising results here in terms of the ability to um, make money to uh, generate revenue and uh, be successful with uh, with advertising so uh, you know from an offload perspective I think a lot of the speakers touched on this off you know, some, some folks said offload is yesterday's news. You know, it's kind of uh, a lot of the operators have moved on beyond offload. And I want to use this chart as a way of trying to illustrate that. So if you look at, you know, between 2008 and now, you know, in five years, just the sheer amount of traffic and the way in which the traffic has grown on uh, SP networks, especially in the more developed markets, uh, you know, hence uh, we picked out AT&T and KDDI, has been tremendous, right? So uh, fundamentally, you know, what's uh, beginning to happen now is once that infrastructure is there, um, um, what we are finding is that uh, beyond offload, when users are given um, high bandwidth experience, they actually use more bits. And so the, you know, the focus really needs to shift to finding a way to then uh, you know, take a lot of these heavy data users and provide to them an experience which uh, you know, in which Wi-Fi is not, you know, uh, a distinct access pipe. You know, it's, it's part of, uh, you know, a continuum of ways of getting onto the network. Uh, cellular, you know, whether it's 3G or LTE could be another way of doing that. So uh, there's a lot of work that's going on in that area, and that integration could happen, you know, from the perspective of roaming. It could happen from the perspective of, uh, I think GR talked about this earlier, multi-mode devices that combine Wi-Fi and uh, licensed uh, technologies in the same platform. But this is, uh, if you look at developed markets, uh, you know, uh, the UK is probably another one, the pattern that you see. If you look at new markets, um, you know, we see a slightly different paradigm. Um, this is an example of an operator in the Middle East. So again here, the numbers are staggering. This is uh, you know, an operator that expects to 
essentially uh, increase the total number of subscribers fivefold over the next several years. Uh, the traffic will obviously go up on the network. But the way they are thinking about the uh, problem is a little different than the traditional, my data network is overloaded, uh, my mobile data network is overloaded, let me use Wi-Fi. What they have done is you know, they've kind of got a figure of merit around how much traffic they want to put on Wi-Fi and which users they want to put on Wi-Fi. And uh, you know, associated with that is a plan that they have, uh, not just for billing and charging, uh, but, but also in terms of capabilities in the network that we are working with them on that allows users to be steered to different networks depending on, of course, you know, what's available, uh, but also things like you know, time of day, you know, what the profile of the user is, what they do, and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, very, very interesting stuff there. Again, less in terms of um, uh, the service that you offer to the end user, but more in terms of, you know, some of the network infrastructure capabilities that are required uh, in order to be able to do the traffic steering uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to help uh, implement those policies. Now, uh, I'm a little crunched on time, so I'm just going to take one example of uh, location-based services. And you know, we have a lot of experts here. Please stop by our booth. You know, we have uh, Mark Grayson here. We have uh, uh, Matt McPherson here. You know, uh, feel, feel free to uh, come talk to our team. But the example that I'm going to walk you through is one that um, you know, we worked on uh, with uh, some of our service provider partners. And you know, we have a published study uh, that uh, talks about this. What this shows is uh, what is the impact of uh, targeted uh, location-based advertising on end-user buying behavior. And the four data points here correspond to uh, four different uh, shopping venues. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the CPM um, metric, it's essentially a measure of advertising effectiveness. So think of it as um, you know, if CPM is a uh, dollar, that means that for every 1,000 hits for an ad, that you get to make a dollar, right? So higher is better. And uh, again, just by way of helping you ground uh, you know, how to think about these numbers, for mobile advertising targeted at cell phones, the CPM number tends to hover around sub $10. So it's, it's really poor. It's uh, you know, in kind of the same league as uh, advertising that's targeted to desktop. So, the key here is that by doing location-based advertising, you can actually get the numbers up into a, uh, into a region which is, um, uh, you know, from an absolute metric standpoint, equal to a better than the best. You know, some of the best numbers that you see are with the cable industry where because of, you know, the traditional structure with head ends, uh, it's possible to have very specific user-targeted advertising. Uh, but just, you know, a couple more uh, anecdotes perhaps. I was curious why this number was so high. Well, it turns out that in Dubai, this location-based advertising was targeted at, uh, you know, was being used in a store that sold jewelry and high-end uh, watches. So, uh, you know, it, it kind of skews the numbers a little bit because when you go and make that purchase, uh, you know, you, you're paying a lot of money. But the, the key here is two things. One is this is real data, and this is, uh, you know, clearly illustrating that um, with Wi-Fi, uh, you you have the ability to track users, understand where they're at, and if you can serve up information that's useful to them, and most importantly, do it quickly, because you, know, you have maybe a minute or two to get the information to them, and you know, do it in a way that's not uh, kind of in your face, uh, then you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, revenue potential here for, um, uh, for um, you know, the operator that's providing the service. Now, from a go-to-market standpoint, uh, you know, for service providers, our customers, you know, it's traditionally these, uh, these two models that everyone's familiar with, you, know, you sell directly to end users or you sell to other service providers in the form of wholesale services. I think what's interesting is uh, you know, the path that's shown on the top, uh, not just for Wi-Fi, but also increasingly, we believe, for uh, you know, licensed radio technologies, where um, you know, some of the um, entities, for example, uh, a landlord that owns um, uh, you know, large, uh, large amounts of um, hotel real estate, you know, they are able to pair up with the service provider in many cases to provide these services. And so the end user might actually see the service coming from the, from the landlord, you know, from the, uh, from the, re uh, from the real estate uh, owner, from the mall operator. Uh, but behind it, the service provider is working closely with them in order to enable that service. 
So, uh, you know, just to kind of quickly sum it all up, uh, number one, it's, it's obvious that Wi-Fi has been uh, extremely successful in terms of uh, justifying the cost associated with its deployment by reducing churn and helping with new um, uh, user um, acquisition. But we think the key next step is to go make these new applications and services happen because, you know, we think that there's a tremendous amount of potential there in terms of um, what could be done. Second, you know, we don't think that Wi-Fi and licensed radio compete with each other. We think they're complementary. Now, they can be complementary in different ways. Uh, AT&T laid out a vision earlier this morning where you have a single device that integrates both radios. Another vision might be that, uh, you know, you have distinct networks, but, you know, in terms of roaming and uh, the way in which users are put on one network or the, uh, or the other, uh, that's seamless. So the key is, you know, you don't want a user pulling out their device and, you know, having to make manual selections of which network they uh, need to go on or you know, which network to turn off. Third, uh, clearly, you know, there's uh, documented uh, evidence that uh, some of the uh, capabilities for location-based advertising uh, can help make money, and we think this is one of maybe you know, eight or nine different services uh, that uh, need more experimentation and uh, more uh, learning uh, to um, to explore as, uh, as we develop it. And finally, uh, from a Cisco perspective, you know, here's um, what we are doing. Uh, obviously, from uh, the standpoint of technology, you know, we have uh, a lot of the architecture building blocks. And more than just the access points, what we are focusing on is how can we, in real time, provide operators or whoever's deploying the network the ability to understand what's happening in the network, to understand what the users are doing, essentially to serve up uh, a compressed uh, a data stream so that you can run analytics on that in real time. And then here's the key. To be able to take that uh, decision that the analytics engine comes up with and then push it back into the network. Right? So there's a lot of work that we're doing in that area. And again, you know, we can talk about this. Uh, um, you know, we can take a couple of questions. We can talk more about it offline. Uh, the second thing that we are doing is you know, we think this is an area where uh, there needs to be a lot of experimentation. You know, we need to learn. And so we're in the process of working with uh, several partners to go run large-scale trials around the world uh, in uh, this area of um, new services and new applications as a way of uh, trying to figure out what do users find useful. You know, we think that's the first step. And then you know, based on that, we can then figure out you know, how we charge for that, you know, what's the business model, and so forth. So you know, for any of you that's interested, uh, that are interested in working with us you know, in understanding what we are doing, you know, please come talk to us. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to have the conversation and uh, figure out how as an industry we can move this forward.